Hello. In this video, I'm going to introduce the topic of the archaeology of place by focusing on a couple of seminal articles that emphasized only some aspects of how certain places in a landscape can acquire meaning, both to people in the past and to archaeologists in the present. Much of the more recent literature on the archaeology of place focuses on topics like features in the landscape that have religious or spiritual meaning, and that may or may not be culturally modified or constructed. Some of those places would never be identifiable as archaeological sites without assistance from oral traditions or documentary sources. Today, I'm instead going to focus on some ideas about how certain places, by attracting repeated visits or stays by people, can acquire characteristics that cause archaeologists to identify them as sites. Meanwhile, the meanings those places had to people in the past quite likely varied considerably, especially over time. Because these particular theories date to the 1970s and 1980s, we should not be surprised that they emphasize economic aspects of places. For most of archaeology's history, archaeologists have conceived of the so-called archaeological record as consisting of sites. And most of these sites were considered to be the remains of ancient settlements, ranging from tiny villages to large cities. Archaeologists also recognized other kinds of sites that were not settlements, such as cemeteries and monuments of various kinds. Some of these were very obtrusive, so it was pretty obvious what and where they were. And even pretty thoroughly ruined settlements sometimes left architectural traces that archaeologists could discover. But a lot of the sites that archaeologists identify and document consist merely of scatters of artifacts on the ground or under the ground. We generally interpret these scatters as evidence of human activity in the past, often settlement activity. But is it reasonable to expect that ancient people's activities were neatly bundled into small and discrete areas of space that we call sites? Didn't people make use of entire landscapes? At the same time, there's no question that some places on the landscape accumulated more evidence for human activity than did others. How does this happen? Where do sites come from, anyway? One factor is that, even with changes to the physical environment over time, some places attract people and human activities more than do others. In 1980, Lewis Binford published an article called Willow's Smoke and Dog's Tales, in which he clarified two terms that he'd been using for quite a while to describe two different kinds of hunter-gatherer economic and residential mobility patterns. Foragers, in Binford's classification, were people who moved their residential camps frequently and exploited resources within a short range of those base camps, rarely, if ever, storing resources. By contrast, what Binford called collectors were people who much less frequently moved their residential base camps, but who also employed special purpose camps where they stayed for shorter periods of time so that they could exploit resources that were too far away from the base camp to be exploited on a daily basis. Binford's ideas on this subject were influenced by ethno-archaeological research he had begun to do among the Nunamiut of northern Alaska in 1969. Binford had noticed that the Nunamiut's daily foraging for food and fuel took place within a radius of less than 10 kilometers from the base camp. To obtain food and supplies that were not available within this foraging radius, special task groups traveled farther away and established temporary camps for anywhere from a few days to several weeks. There was also a much larger territory that Binford calls the Extended Range that included territory with which the group was familiar and where they sometimes established base camps. Outside that Extended Range was what Binford called the Visiting Zone, where members of the group sometimes visited relatives or trading partners. As I mentioned in another video, way back in 1826, Johann Heinrich von Thunen proposed a model for the land use around a city. According to this model, the most intensive land use, highest land values, and highest rents occurred in a zone immediately adjacent to the city. More extensive agriculture occurred in a zone outside that, and the outermost zone had the lowest land values and the most extensive land use. Although Binford doesn't cite von Thunen, there's no question that central place theory had an influence on his own theories. In fact, 
Binford claims that it's unrealistic to view the zones around a residential camp, quote, as simply a series of concentric circles where the use which is made of each area is exclusively conditioned by the transport and labor costs of exploiting resources. Superficially, Binford's model looks a lot like the von Thunen one. Following his Nunamiat experience, he sees the campground and the play radius associated with a residential camp as the central zone. Just outside that is the foraging radius, the zone within which task parties can do things and return to camp on a single day. Next we find the logistical radius. This is the zone where excursions by task parties last at least overnight and potentially for several weeks or even months. Beyond the logistical radius is a territory that Binford calls the extended range. This includes territory with which the residents of the camp are familiar and that includes places where they've camped previously or that are potential locations for future residential camps. Finally, outside that is what Binford calls the visiting zone. This is territory where there are other residential camps whose members may be friends, trading partners, relatives, or potential spouses. Although Binford's model is superficially similar to von Thunen's, he puts it to very different purpose. Most obviously, he applies it to hunter-gatherers rather than to an urban society. But also, as an archaeologist, his main interest is in what kinds of sites we could expect to find within these zones, and how temporality, especially seasonality, could affect their character. The kinds of sites we would expect to occur vary by these zones. Within the play radius of the main camp, we might expect special activity areas. Within the foraging radius, we would find what Binford called locations. These are places where a person or task group stopped for a while to carry out a particular task, such as collecting fuel or gathering berries. Within the logistical radius, we'd expect to find a variety of specialized campsites, as well as things like caches, observation posts, and rest stops. Thus, the character of what archaeologists would recognize as sites varies crudely with the distance away from the base camp. Here we see an idealized view of the logistical territory of a single residential camp at a particular point in time. Near the center of the map is the residential camp and its associated foraging radius, which I've shaded in green to make it comparable to the previous image. But at this level of detail, you can see that it's actually made up of the daily wanderings of task groups and individuals who were searching for food, fuel, and other resources in the vicinity of the camp. Under some circumstances, this foraging radius would quickly become depleted of resources. But the camp also draws on resources from the logistical zone. For example, a work party might travel to a lake to the west of the camp and stay there for several days while fishing, and then return to the residential camp with the bulk of their catch. Meanwhile, a hunting party might travel eastward and establish a hunting camp for a week or 10 days with several observation stands or hunting stations in the vicinity of the camp. Assuming the hunt was successful, there would also be kill sites in the vicinity of the camp and probably preliminary butchering. Meanwhile, yet another task group might be away at a trapping camp for many weeks or even months. The trapping camp would actually have its own foraging zone as well as trap lines that could extend for hundreds of kilometers. Really extensive trap lines might have more than one trapping camp. At the end of the trapping season, this task group would bring pelts back to the residential camp where they'd be ready for exchange or else be made into clothing for the group. What we're seeing here is logistical mobility, but hunter-gatherers also made use of residential mobility. Binford was interested in the ways that hunter-gatherer groups use mobility as a strategy to improve their access to resources in their territories. We've already seen some aspects of this in the daily forays into the foraging zone as well as longer visits to the various logistical camps. Aside from daily foraging, the two main types of mobility are residential mobility, which involves moving the entire residential camp, and logistical mobility, which involves temporary visits to other campsites by a subset of the residential group. As already noted, there can also be visiting, which involves travel by a few individuals to more distant residential camps in other territories, either for trade, 
or for social reasons. Among the most highly mobile hunter-gatherers, there may be no logistical zone at all. Among early 20th century Punan in the interior of Borneo, for example, residential moves were made so frequently that there was not even time to exploit an entire foraging radius. The Punan exploited resources in about half of a foraging radius and then moved the residential camp to the edge of that radius to begin exploiting another one. Binford calls this a half-radius continuous mobility pattern, and it may be more common in landscapes where desired resources are fairly even in their distribution. Binford identifies another model that he calls the complete radius leapfrog pattern. He claims that it's common in high biomass environments and involves a type of exploitation in which game and other resources are taken in proportion to their frequency of encounter. Notice that the logistical zones overlap and that sometimes a new residential camp occurs within the logistical zone of a previous camp. In fact, we could expect that logistical task groups sometimes scouted out the location for the new residential camp, or the group established a residential camp in a location that was previously a logistical camp. Binford's final model is called the point-to-point -point mobility pattern. Binford sees this pattern as applying to relatively patchy environments, where key resources, such as waterholes, are very sparsely distributed. For example, Binford sees this model as applicable to parts of Australia and to the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa. But he also observed it among the Nunamut of northern Alaska. The distances between residential camps in these scenarios could sometimes be very substantial. Binford uses an idealized example to illustrate how residential moves within a region can affect the composition of assemblages at sites within that region. Here I use a very similar example showing the occupation of Site A by residential camp in early summer. Task groups at Site A do fishing and trapping, while other task groups establish hunting camps at Sites B and C. Later in summer, the residential camp moves to Site B, where camp residents do fishing and some hunting. Meanwhile, logistical groups establish hunting camps at Sites A, D, E, and F, and Site C serves as an observation stand for the hunters at Site F. Then, in the fall, the residential camp moves again, this time to Site E, and Sites B, D, and F serve as hunting camps, while Site G is used as an observation stand. Binford's example shows that even over a period of only a few months, the nature of the activities that occur at each site and therefore of the artifacts that get left there as residues, can change rather dramatically. Furthermore, in some cases it might be impossible to disentangle these various occupations stratigraphically, in which case we might infer, incorrectly, that almost all of the sites were residential camps, because their assemblages show evidence for such a wide variety of activities. Alternatively, should accumulation rates be such that each of these occupations was distinguishable stratigraphically, we might identify a puzzling sequence of different kinds of assemblages at each site. In 1981, just a year before Binford published his article on the archaeology of place, Robert Foley published an article that dealt with many of the same issues. Like Binford, he identified a somewhat concentric pattern of land use around a home base or base camp. What he called a peripheral activity area is similar to what Binford called the play radius. And what he calls the home range roughly combines Binford's foraging and logistical zones. Within that home range are various kinds of temporary and special purpose camps, as well as locations where various kinds of hunting and gathering activities took place. Unlike Binford's paper, however, Foley's paper concerns itself not with the character of assemblages at various points in the landscape, but with the artifact densities that result from the cumulative effect of activities in the landscape. For example, he assumes that the intensive occupation of a home base would lead to relatively high artifact densities in the home base and in its periphery. Over time, regular loss or discard of artifacts would result in artifact scatters with higher but variable densities within the various kinds of camps 
and along the roots that join them. There would also be lower densities of artifacts in parts of the home range that were less frequented, or where the activities that took place there were less likely to result in the discard of artifacts. In order to estimate how many artifacts would be lost or discarded in a given year, Foley makes some assumptions about the size of the home range, the size of the home base, how often the home base moves, what activities were taking place at the home base, and what was going on in the periphery of the home base. He also makes some assumptions about the size, number, and discard rates at temporary camps and other so-called focal points within the home range. These rough estimates then allow Foley to calculate how many artifacts would have been lost or discarded in total within the home range during one year. We shouldn't make too much of the exact value of his resulting total of some 163,000 artifacts. The important takeaway is that even relatively modest discard rates can yield very high numbers of artifacts in a year, not to mention how many we might expect to be deposited in 10 years or a century or a millennium. However, Foley recognized that deposition of artifacts was not the whole picture, as there are a number of post-depositional effects that can either reduce or concentrate the artifacts that are available to archaeologists today. For example, a number of geological processes can result in the burial of artifacts so that they are not detectable by archaeologists. Erosion, especially by wind, can remove sediment in such a way that artifacts deposited at markedly different times can be collapsed into a single level. This results in a sort of palimpsest, in which closely associated artifacts in fact belong to completely different cultural contexts. Some other geological processes can move artifacts from one place to another, sometimes concentrating them in such a way as to mislead us into identifying a location as a residential camp. Many places in the landscape can exhibit a complex combination of such factors, while we also have to recognize that many artifacts are destroyed over time. Although this destruction is more pronounced for artifacts that are made in whole or in part of organic materials, even lithics can become broken or eroded to the point that they're no longer recognizable. Both Binford's and Foley's articles have important implications for the way that archaeologists interpret the sites they excavate and the landscapes they survey. If nothing else, it should be pretty obvious that site is a fairly slippery concept, especially as it applies to hunter-gatherers and other highly mobile groups. We should not expect all sites to have been used for habitation, and we should expect that some places in the landscape could be used for habitation on one occasion and for some special purpose on another. A key aspect is that hunter-gatherers may travel in and extract resources from almost their entire landscape territory. But there are usually particular places within this landscape that tend to attract them more often. I've always liked this quotation from Susan Blair, an archaeologist at University of New Brunswick, because of the way it captures this concept. She says, Our concerns with the known aggregations of artifacts and features beneath particular patches of ground is in sharp contrast to that of our Aboriginal advisors, who talk of salmon pools, collecting areas, and berry grounds, woven together by canoeways and portages into living landscapes. If, as archaeologists, we're going to continue to use the concept of site, we need to be conscious of the fact that these sites are just places in the landscape that happen to have accumulated a lot of archaeological remains over time, and that these accumulations can occur for a wide variety of reasons, of which habitation may not even be the most important one. And although these theories are more nuanced in their use of the site concept than was generally the case in previous research, it's notable that they still employ somewhat rigid and often dichotomous categories for what really would have been continuous variation. It's not realistic to classify these phenomena as either high or low mobility, nomadic or sedentary, forager or collector, or residential settlement versus location or special purpose site. In fact, I don't think this is what either Binford or Foley had in mind. Most places in the landscape would not only serve for different purposes at different times, use of those places would also be on a sliding scale between these extremes. These arguments also had immediate implications for the interpretation of the archaeological record. 
Most notably, Louis Binford used his logistical model in a debate with the French prehistorian Francois Bord about the interpretation of Paleolithic sites in France. At many Mousterian Paleolithic sites in France, archaeologists had identified a curious alternation of stone industries in the stratified deposits in these sites. The dominant French interpretation of this phenomenon, as expressed by Francois Bord, is that these different industries, among the lithics, represented different social groups, perhaps even ethnic groups. And the alternation of these lithic industries indicated that these coexisting social groups moved around in the landscape and occupied the same sites, but at different times. By contrast, Binford adopted a more functional interpretation of the industries. He assumed that the stone tool composition of the assemblages would be related to the activities that took place at the site when they were deposited. Consequently, you'd expect different frequencies of the various tool types to accumulate at the place when it operated as, say, a hunting camp or a trapping camp than when it was a residential camp. Although the Binford board debate focused mainly on cave sites, which are admittedly rather unusual places on the landscape, Foley's research nicely shows how these processes can play out to create what archaeologists would call sites, but that are really just places in the landscape that have attracted greater accumulations of artifacts over time. In fact, sometimes the greatest accumulations with the highest densities of artifacts that archaeologists would readily identify as sites are in fact palimpsests that result from the overlap of several different scatters that really had nothing to do with one another. Other than that, they indicate that something attracted people to this general area repeatedly. It could be that it was a good place for fishing, or that it had extensive berry grounds, for example. Although we would expect the physical environment to change slowly over time, there would still be some places in the landscape that would tend to attract humans to them over and over again. Whenever they stopped at one of these places, they would have dropped a few artifacts, eventually building up a small scatter. But we could expect these attractors to shift slightly in location as well, while people can also be attracted for different reasons. As people deposit small numbers of artifacts on each of these repeated visits to attractive locations, scatters of artifacts increase in density and overlap. After hundreds or perhaps thousands of years, the cumulative effect can be very large scatters that an archaeologist would likely interpret as a large site. Even though at no point in its history was the entire area of this site ever occupied or used at the same time. These overlapping scatters are known as palimpsests. Although Binford and Foley highlighted these issues among hunter-gatherers, they also have relevance to other kinds of societies. Perhaps most obviously, these issues of place apply to nomadic and transhuman pastoral peoples. Traditionally, Bedouin, for example, had a very high degree of residential mobility. Moving their tents, and sometimes whole villages of tents, periodically to seek new pastures and typically employing what Binford would call a point-to-point -point pattern of movement. But the Bedouin also employed a certain degree of logistical movement. For example, when individuals or small groups engaged in trade with more sedentary people. But even traditional agricultural societies with much lower levels of residential mobility do employ some logistical mobility. While many of a farmer's tasks occur in a zone that would be roughly equivalent to Binford's foraging zone, it was not uncommon for ancient and medieval farmers to have some fields that were far enough away that they'd have to stay overnight sometimes in order to tend them. In some agricultural societies, these overnight stays in the fields were a regular occurrence, sometimes lasting for several days at a time. The farmers might just sleep on the ground or in tents, but when this was a regular occurrence, they sometimes built field huts. These were small buildings that served as something like a base of operations for logistical stays for things like harvesting. They could also be used to store equipment. The inner zone around an agricultural settlement is usually called the infield. This is the zone where farmers could visit their fields and return home in a single day. 
It's also the zone where they would invest the most labor and materials to improve the fields, including manuring them. Often, the manure that the farmers applied to these fields was actually a mixture of manure and waste from middens. Since the middens would contain kitchen waste, the farmers would also be depositing broken potsherds on their fields. In Mediterranean archaeology, the resulting phenomenon of increased artifact densities in a ring around settlement sites actually has a name, site halos. Outside these halos, in what Binford would call the logistical zone, we can find a number of kinds of sites other than harvesting camps. Among these in some parts of the world are shepherd's huts, cattle drive camps, logging camps, charcoal burners camps, and potter's clay pits. And yes, some agricultural communities even have hunting camps. As I mentioned at the beginning, Binford's and Foley's articles only deal with certain aspects of place. Both of them were mainly interested in hunter-gatherers, and both were strongly disposed toward economic factors that led to certain places in the landscape being favored for either settlement or for carrying out various tasks. I hope to do another video in the near future that deals with some of the other approaches to place, including phenomenological ones. Meanwhile, I hope this video helped you understand at least one type of theory for how different kinds of human activities some of them seeming fairly insignificant on their face, can cumulatively create conditions that archaeologists typically identify as sites, and why we should be careful about how we interpret these. After all, some of them may be palimpsests that result from thousands of separate task-focused events, but that we could inadvertently interpret as a large settlement. In case you'd like to learn more about this topic, I've listed some references in the credits at the end of the video. And if you'd like to be alerted as I upload new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.